Okay, now we're coming to Revelation 17, 15, and to explain it in better detail, I gotta go to the Greek. Waters. Politics. Okay. Waters, right here. Okay, it's got a lot of metaphorical meaning. It really ends up meaning what's circulating in your head. It can be the water of the word, or it can be the water of false doctrine, the water of philosophy, the, lo the water of whatever it is that you believe in that motivates you. Because water is necessary for life, and your whole life depends on what you believe. Every single thing you do, if you lift up your finger, if you grab a fork and you lift up and you put some food on it, and you lift it up to your mouth, that's an act of faith. You believe you can do that and you're surprised if you can't you're even dismayed if you can't you believe you can do that you have to believe that you can grab the fork and put food on it and lift it to your mouth in order to do it belief drives everything you do so the question is what do I believe just like water is essential to life you can live without food easily for two, three months. Okay, if you had to. Depends on your metabolism and a bunch of other things. But I mean, you know, I had no trouble going without food for 30 days. At all. And the longer you go without food, the easier it is. But if your metabolism doesn't suit that, then going without food even one day is too much for you. All right. So imagine how hard it was on Christ because he had perfect metabolism. Alright, but water, you got to have water every day. You might be able to go two, three days without water, but that's about it. Air, oxygen, you have to have it. Like, you know, you can maybe go a minute. You have to train to do that. You maybe go a minute without oxygen. You can hold your breath for a minute. That's about it. So water is essential to being alive. Water of what you think. What you think is the water to your soul. Is it tainted water like Flint, Michigan? Or is it clean water like the word? That's the point. So politics ends up being what circulates in the soul of people when they get into politics. Okay, and that's, I'm not saying politics is wrong. It's a question of what's most, where, where are your waters? If your waters are the word of God waters, then politics has a place. Everything has a place. But it has a place underneath the word. The word determines what the place of politics is. And Christ determined that and told us what it was. My kingdom is not of this world. So it's not like you're supposed to be apathetic about politics. You're supposed to be involved because it's part of being a good citizen. And it doesn't mean that you can't seek political office either. But what it does mean is that you give to God what's God's and to Caesar what's Caesar's. And it is not Caesar's when life begins. That's God's choice. Genesis 2-7. And so all these harlot Christians backing Trump and ever since the 1960s, they're trying to give to Caesar what belongs to God. You want to be anti-abortion? Fine, I'm anti-abortion too. I'm adopted. I don't believe in abortion. But it's not mine to determine for somebody else what they ought to believe. Because my waters are my waters. And their waters are their waters. And God gives waters to everybody who wants it. So it's not up to me to tell somebody else whether they should have an abortion or not. And the biggest reason why is because it's God who determines life. And what if God is saying, what if God wants you to ask him? Let's say you got pregnant. I don't care why. Does God want you to abort or not? That is a question you put to him. I don't have the right to put that question to the government for you. Okay? Fundamental violation of church and state. Separation of church and state means you should have no laws at all, pro or con, abortion. Because it's God's choice. Alright? The waters, then, of politics, when you reject God's waters, 
and you go into political waters and you want to try to create a lie that abortion is Caesar's choice, then that's politics. You see that? All right? So, what is going on in your head? So, therefore, the definition, waters which you saw in the harlots is it, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That's kind of vague, so let's get more specific. Peoples, Laos, you can see it in the stupid Strong's thing there, because I'm focusing on there on the English. But here's the actual Greek. As you can see, the definition is a lot more involved. Literally, tribe. I'll just click on it because the stupid color is wrong. Tribe, nation, all those who have the same stock and language, especially of the people of Israel. In other words, and there's no such thing now. Let's say, you know, um, what? Cain married one of his sisters, all right, and had kids. So the descendants of Cain would be with Cain's genes in them. They would have a common background. They would have a common culture. They would have a common something because they've been around each other and they're homogen homogeneous to a certain extent. Okay? So they would have glossa, language, fule, tribe. Oh, golly, I hate it when it does that. Fule, tribe, ethnos, location, calling itself a nation. In other words, if e like I'm supposed to be Basque, French Basque, supposedly. All right, I'm adopted, so I don't really know if this is true. All right, the Basques are like, well, I don't know, a million people left on the planet now who are Basque. All right. They all tend to live, well, not that actually that's not even true either, but a lot of them tend to live in the, between northern Spain and southern France, in the Pyrenees area. They tend to have the same, they call it Escoldunac, which is the Basque language. They, they, it's, it was never really much of a language, actually. It was just sort of spoken in the home. All right? They were therefore of the same tribe because they all stuck together ethnically. And therefore you can call them a nation because they're all in about the same place. Well, not all of them, but the ones who are there are there in the same place. They've been there for a long time. So they have a language. They have genetics. And they have a place all in common for a long time. All right? That's not the same. That's just talking about sort of like race. Okay, but you can't post Noah. You, you, you can't really call any one group of people a race. You can't use skin color for sure because it's the color white or the color dark is in every single so-called group of people on the planet. Even the blacks in the blackest part of Africa are usually about 25% white. All of us are part black, part yellow, part brown, part Asian, part white, part whatever you want to call it. North. Okay, we're all mutts. Because there was so much traveling that went on for so long. But our parents and our parents' parents and our parents' 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 parents all might have been within, you know, 60 miles, 2,000 miles of each other our whole lives for centuries. Well, that makes us think of ourselves as a people of the same stock and language. Because that's basically what happens when you got a bunch of people who pretty much stay together century after century. It's not a race. But you they think of themselves as a tribe. Especially if they can point back to some common ancestor like Israel can point back to a Abraham. As far as I know, Israel is the only one who can do that. Because the rest of us are all descendants of Noah and Abraham was too. 
But if you got Abraham's genes in you, then you're a son of Abraham by, you know, bloodline. And I wouldn't surprise you if 90% of us weren't. But, you know, I, I would bet that, you know, 80, 90% of us, maybe more, have at least one of Abraham's genes in us because God made a promise to Abraham that you wouldn't be able to number his children. Now, there are two meanings to that. Because you have, if you do what Abraham did, you're a son of Abraham. That's what Galatians 3 covers. And what did Abraham do? That's Genesis 15, 6. He believed Jesus Christ paid for his sins. But he didn't call him Jesus Christ because that wasn't his name then. His name in the time of Abraham was like El El Yon. Just God Most High. Okay? Now, that's first definition. So it focuses on like your genetic similarity and geographical similarity over time. You've all been in the same place for a long time, blah, 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 blah. Okay? You may or may not be of the same race, but you've just been around together for ages. That's one group. And it politicizes around that idea. Oh, we're Arab. Oh, we're Irish. Oh, we're this. Oh, we're that. Because cause you, you and your friends and your parents, parents, and your parents, 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 parents have always lived in the same place and you tend to have the same accent and you tend to speak the same language and you tend to glorify the same things blah 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 that's Laoi, Laos people and word Kai Akloi, now this is this is where it really gets different this is like what came out of Egypt Okay, it's translated here with the word multitudes. See? That means a bunch of people like America. A whole bunch of people came over to the same place from many different places and tribes and cultures. And they just happened to congregate in the same place. You know, there were all kinds of Indian tribes who lived in this place in America before the whites came so-called whites but it wasn't just the whites who came here now was it okay at this point we have many colors pretty much every color you want to name pretty much every tribe nation whatever you want to name is right here in America which Donald Trump is seeking to divide by making an issue of being white Always sending out his dog whistle to the white nationalists. Yeah, that's the opposite of what America is. And frankly, it's the opposite of any nation. Even China, which largely looks Asiatic. And to those of us not being around Asians very much, we think they all look alike and they think we all look alike. Okay, but there are many different nations. There are many different groups of people. There are many tribes. Okay, I mean, the, the, there, there, there's a lot of different tribes. Africa, it's the same thing. Okay, so they all happen to look black. Yeah, because they're, they're, they're living near the equator. And your skin needs to change color in order for you to survive. That's called adaptation. In melanin. Which colors your skin. Like when you go out in the sun and you tan. The fact that you can tan. That your skin can turn brown means you got some black blood in you, honey, or you'd be dead. So Akloi means mixtures of races, or whatever you want to call it, people from different geographical origins that all congregate in one place. Okay, and then you got ethne. Now ethne is basically saying, well. You're all living together, not necessarily, um, what do you want to call it? Not necessarily in one geographical location, but you stay together. Alright, see? Associated with living together, company, swarm, troop. This is usually translated nations. Alright, and then you got glossoi, common language. Now, politics have been, from time immemorial, divided by these things. 
Oh, I'm I'm Jewish. I'm Irish. I'm French. I'm bleh. I'm well. Actually, none of those terms are actually proper to the word Laos. They'd be proper to the word Akloi. But we think of them as well. I'm 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 a separate kind of person from all other kind of persons because I'm French or I'm Irish. We tend to think of them as if it was a race. It's not. Okay? Aqua is more common of what we really are. We're a bunch of people from all kinds of different backgrounds and they all happen to be in the same nation. So a whole bunch of people came and went, came and went, came and went, and pretty much every nation in the world, especially in the Middle East, and especially in Europe, especially in Russia, especially in China. Lots of movement, migration of peoples came in and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Asia too, I'm not leaving them out, I'm just saying that it's easiest to prove what I'm saying by reference to Russia and Europe and the Middle East. But it's really every nation. Okay? But you share a similar location. Like, I'm in America. I was born here. Alright? Anybody else who's born here is also an American. That's Akloy. And we politicize based on, well, I'm an American and you're not. In fact, we're pretty arrogant about that, actually. But every nation has its own version of Americans. Okay? So you can be arrogant about your tribe, or you can be arrogant about your common location, or you can be arrogant about the fact that, oh, you're this person and we're this other person and we always travel together. You can be of different tribes, but you've been around each other for so long. You think of yourself as a nation. Just like, you know, that's how the, the Romans classified it. We had the Huns. Nobody knows the racial grouping of the Huns, what they really were. We have the Lombards. Nobody really knows where the Lombards actually came from. We have the Rus. Well, people speculate that they came from the north because they were light-skinned and light-colored hair. But you really don't know. But they shared that location. And they moved around together. The Vikings. There's, that's an classic example of nation. It has some kind of ethnic ties where we get the word ethnic from because the Greek word there is ethnos. That's where we get ethnic from. But it's really a group of people who travel together so they're not necessarily in one location but they stick together wherever they go and they're going and they're going and they're going. That's ethnos. And then Glossa, well, that's the easiest one of all. Everybody in my group speaks French. Everybody in my group speaks Spanish, you know. Oh, we're all Latin America. We should band together because we all speak Spanish. Okay. See, those are political. Those are little political things that people politicize. All right, so the waters, which you saw where the harlot religion sits, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In other words, the religious beast that the war, that the harlot is driving because she's being unfaithful to God, fake church, ends up having all this power. Let me bring it down. And he have having all this power over. Va over See, this is what's so hysterical. World religion is going to take over people who would otherwise divide themselves by tribes and otherwise divide themselves by their common location and otherwise divide themselves by the fact they've always traveled together and otherwise divide themselves by their common language there's going to be some kind of universal religion which is going to appeal to so many people and this was true of ancient Rome this is exactly what happened in ancient Rome and they're all going to fall for whatever the harlot is selling they're going to be enthralled by the religion she's selling. Just like all these seven mountains people are enthralled by the most immoral, disgusting, fraud, cheat, liar that ever walked America. As far as I can tell. I've never, I have never in my life 
seen anybody as immoral, evil, fraud cheat liar that you can prove from going 30 years ago. Forget the fact that he's running for president. You know, and they all complain, oh, the press is lying. No, the press is just, done, is just repeating information that was already in the public domain 30 years ago, or 10 years ago, or 5 years ago. I mean, what would possess Donald Trump to lie about the fact that his own recorded voice pretending to be John Miller fantasizing about how Madonna wanted to date him? You he has a very distinctive voice. That recording, when it played, everybody on the planet knew it was Donald Trump. So how come Trump denied it? Why bother? That's not my voice. Yep, yeah, but you admitted it was your voice under oath in court 20 years ago when that recording was played and you were asked the same questions. And that was all in deposition and we still had the legal records 20 years ago. So why is he lying about it now? Stuff like that. I mean, this is like the biggest advertisement to Christians. This is not the guy. I don't back him. But the Seven Mountains people, well, they reverse scripture, so why not reverse the truth on anything? Well, that's what they're doing. And they are the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Whatever their nations and tongues are, they're in America. You mean any nation, any tongue, any multitude, any people, nobody knows where anybody comes from. And you tell stories about it. You know, my family has its own cherished stories about how we come from Mary, Queen of Scots. Who knows if that's true? And who cares? Alright. Magic blood. Oh, yeah. Harlot. That's all harlot stuff. Oh, Donald Trump is the Savior. That's what all these Christians are saying. How can you say that of this guy? I mean, Rasputin. Famous Rasputin from Russia. Okay, really ugly, horrible guy. See the film Nicholas and Alexandra. Tom Baker plays Rasputin in that, and it's a really good film. Rasputin was about as stupid and bad as it gets. Donald Trump makes Rasputin look like Mary Poppins. Okay? So, see? The harlot is selling her wares. And everybody wants, wants some. Waters. What waters are you drinking? Poisoned waters. And so anybody who buys into Trump You'll notice that within 30 days, and this the most poignant example of this is Ted Cruz, within 30 days they go from being a sane, reasoning, independent human being to a pile of drooling mush who lie just to lie with impunity. They just constantly lie. You know, that happened to Newt Gingrich. It happened to... Uh, what's his face? Rudy Giuliani? It happened to Kellyanne Conway because we know what they said and what their positions and thoughts were before Trump. Go look at any of those people. Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, Ted Cruz is the most stark example. He stood up to Trump even on the Wednesday of the last day of the, the Republican convention. He had strength he had courage. He was really good. And then he came into Trump, and now what is he? Ben Carson had some, some moxie to him. He's just a... Blah, 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 blah. Chris Christie had some moxie to him, and he's just a... Blah, 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 blah. They lose their brains. Their brains turn to mush. And they lie. It's just like, I've got... If They have a compunction to lie, just like Trump. That's what the harlot does to you. And you feel so good doing it, honey. Yeah, because that's what religion does. Don't you feel good when you count those beads or light those candles or stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, or hear all that music or smell all that incense swinging? Or stand up and sit down and sing one more stanza of Just As I Am or have Benny Hinn knock you on the, on the forehead and you fall down and oh, now the demon's gone. You know what? The fool born every minute. 
And that's what Constantine sold. Constantine started that in 310 A.D. You can go look this up. He told his troops that he got a vision from Apollo that he would get a laurel wreath promising 120 years of victory if they would follow him to go take over Rome. Well, he didn't quite get as far as he wanted to, so in 312 AD, two years later, he gets a vision from Jesus Christ saying in hoc signo vinces. You just changed the name. Who gave him a vision? And you'll conquer if you follow me. It's the same story. So you just switch out the God. Well, that's what a harlot does. You want me to do it to you this way? Oh, uh, no, you don't want it that way. Okay, how about if I do it to you this way? And for an extra $50, I'll give you a, you know, fill in the blank. Religion is harlotry everywhere in the Bible and here. So, now, what's going to have to happen then? And the ten horns, the ten kings, the ten powers that you saw, condensed into seven, of course, and the beast, these will hate the harlot. That's happening right now under your nose. The Seven Mountains people backing Trump. Trump hates them. A lot of them hate him already. There is a big fire going on inside the GOP as I talk, which is exactly what this says. Because Satan doesn't know when the rapture is going to happen, and since Christians are so apostate, maybe it'll happen now. Because rapture is going to happen for two reasons and both at the same time. The number promised, you know, because Christ prepaid for sin, so he prepaid for humans. Those that God foreknows and had prepaid to believe in him will complete for church. In other words, if he lets the world go on one more day with church on it, nobody knew is going to believe anymore because church is too apostate. So the balloon goes up because we're apostate. So the number of believers that are actually left at the time that the rapture happens could be just one. I want to desperately write a novel about that. I would call it The Last Believer. It would make a great movie. And totally upend all the typical cunt about, you know, left behind in the rapture. Because the real Bible is telling a very different story. It's like recall of an ambassador. So the, politi the politicians hate the religious people, and the religious people hate the politicians. And actually that's been going on since the 1960s, because Jerry Falwell was trying to get the Republicans to endorse his agenda. And they pretended to. Because, what did it say up here? All right? Eighth is of the seven. The politics was first. They're using the religion to get their politics, to get their political power. And that's what happened in the 1960s. Jerry Falwell came up with his little, and it's not just him, I'm, I mention him because Jerry Falwell Jr. is on Trump's side now. Okay, totally antichrist. Absolute. Okay. In the 1960s, though, his dad was doing the same thing. And the Republicans looked at them and said, well, how many Christians are there? And can we pretend to go along with them in order to get their votes? Well, yeah, okay, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. And along comes Richard Nixon. He's a Quaker. And okay, well, I'll play the Christian card. That makes me look good. And so he delivered, he got a bunch of Christians started voting for him because of that. You know, wanted him. And then he didn't give in to their agenda, though. And after him, well, then that, that, that produced, that produced, uh, eventually, Reagan. Oh, yeah, oh, Christian this and that. So the, the silent, the 
what was it? What do they call themselves? The silent majority under Nixon became the moral majority under, I think it was Reagan. And Reagan didn't give in to the Christian right either. So they got more and more strident and more and more political. And then after Reagan, of course, you have Bush. And he didn't give in to him either. And then you have Bush too. And he didn't give in to him either. And then, of course, after Bush too, you got Obama. So that's when the Tea Party formed. Because, oh boy, oh boy, you know, we're the eighth and we want to be one of the seven. Harlot. And the politicians, each time, they hated her. I mean, there, this is historically true, Christianity. Christ, Christians have, historically, they go off the wagon. They don't get into the Bible. So they get into politics instead. And that was the bane of Rome's existence in the first 200 years. After Christ died. There were a few, and some that were initially faithful. But a whole bunch of them decided, well, you know... That we believe in the real God, so we're better than you. And there ended up being enough idiots like that to make Christianity persona non grata in the Roman Empire. There really wasn't a whole lot of persecution of Christians by the government. The government just didn't want any... It's just keep the peace, pay your taxes, and we don't care. But like, you know, Ignatius, one of the stupid people of the so-called church fathers okay he went to Trajan and says oh I'm a Christian you have to put me to death now and Trajan's like okay you know this happened in in uh, Anatolia I think it was Ephesus I'm not really sure if it was Ephesus but it was someplace in the east and Trajan says him oh, okay well then go deliver yourself over to the Colosseum in Rome and go get yourself killed. So Ignatius spent six months doing that. He goes real slow because he it only took like 20 days to go from where he was con talking to Trajan to Rome. Okay, they had a real good travel system by then. And if you went by boat, you could get there in 20 days, maybe even less. Okay, you get there in a, like seven days seven to ten days if you had the access to the royal you know the imperial post but he didn't but it didn't take six months that's how long it would take if you went over land and took your time doing it okay you could travel the whole world in less than two years Thor Heider all proved that just in a boat okay so Ignatius was a real jerk and a lot of Christians were like him Holotry. Well, see, he's going to convert the religion. Oh, see how pious I am. See how pious I am. I'm delivering myself to the lions. I'm going to be killed by the lions. Blah, 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 blah. And he wrote all these letters to everybody on his way. So, why wouldn't you hate the harlot? Why wouldn't you? You, you know obnoxious Christians in your own periphery. So... Somebody trying to actually get things done because politics isn't ipse bad. It's going to hate the religious types who are trying to insert their or into it. And they're going to make her desolate and naked. What that means is everything that she prides herself on, she's going to lose. And naked, it means shamed. It's not a sexual idea. It means that you don't have anything. Your clothes are stripped. That was a way to shame you. I don't know anybody who doesn't associate being naked with shame in public. Okay? And we eat her flesh. In other words, eat up all of her, you know, body politic, as it were. And burn her up with fire. Now, here my pastor, when he covered this, and that's going to be important, um, is talking about nuclear explosion. And we spent a lot of time when he was going through Revelation, starting at this point, Try and figure out if it's fission or fusion that Peter is talking about in Second Peter 3 talking about this end. But it's this isn't the end of the world that Peter was talking about, but it's the same idea. There's going to be some kind of worldwide war that's going to have some kind of nuclear thing fire off. Alright? And I'm going to cover that next.